We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, good morning for those joining us from, from the Americas and good evening for those joining us from uh, Asia. Uh, my name is Karolina Matskevich. I represent the organization called My Data Global uh, that is hosting this session today together with the Finnish Ministry for Foreign Affairs. Uh, we are very happy to join the Internet Governance Forum for the third time, um, second time online. And today is a special day as in Finland, we celebrate the Independence Day and, and happy to uh, celebrate it together uh, with all of you internationally across the, across the globe. Uh, the session title is the Digital Identity for Gender Equality and Data Justice. And the aim of the session is to discuss interconnections between digital identity, data protection, data justice, and gender equality. We're looking for good practices, but also some practices to be avoided in policy making and practical implementation of the digital identity regimes and identify a set of principles that support the technological progress, respect human rights and accelerate gender equality. As you can see on this introductory slide, uh, we have a, a fantastic lineup of speakers coming from international organizations, um, civil society, government and business. Uh, so we also uh, have uh, speakers coming from different, different parts of the world. I'm joined today uh, with uh, my colleagues, both from the My Data Global, Temur Oponen, who will be moderator of the discussion, and uh, my colleague from the Finnish Ministry for Foreign Affairs, Janette Sorsimo, who is the rapporteur uh, for the session. She will collect the key takeaways and um, calls to action for the session. And we will start with the keynote from Vijayanti Desai from World Bank, and then we will hear the interventions from all our speakers, and we will uh, conclude uh, with the uh, well, we will, we will uh, have time, good time for the discussion. So with that, I would like to invite Vijayanti um, to start sharing uh, to, 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 to the stage, to the virtual stage. Uh, Vijayanti Desai, she is a practice manager at World Bank, and she leads the World Bank identification for development and digitalizing government to person payment initiative two global multi-sectoral initiatives. And Vijayanti will set the scene for this discussion, uh, tell us a bit more about building trusted and inclusive ID systems and also touch on the principles for identification for sustainable uh, development. So Vijayanti, please, the uh, please. virtual stage is yours. Well, thank you so much, uh, Carolina, and to all the panelists um, for, for this uh, session. I just wanted to confirm that you do see my screen. We do. Yes, perfectly okay, fine. Perfect. Okay, wonderful. Um, so I'm going to um, touch upon uh, a few broader topics and then look forward to a very engaging um, panel discussion. But to start with, why does ID matter for equitable, sustainable development? So what we know is um, from our data set that a billion people globally lack proof of uh, legal identity. And um, uh, unfortunately, the vast majority are in low-income countries, uh, women and other marginalized groups. Uh, and this is an issue because of the barriers that uh, many of them face in exercising their rights, accessing services and other opportunities. Um, and what we know from other um, sources and analytics uh, done by other organizations that 
uh, even when people have an ID, it's often not secure, verifiable, or privacy protecting. So many more than the 1 billion, um, up to maybe 3 uh, or 4 billion uh, who don't have secure, verifiable, or privacy protecting forms of ID. And, and this is, of course, one of the UN um, SDG targets, um, but it, it's more than just that one SDG target. The, the reason why this is an, a, a topic that we've been engaging for, for several years now is because it um, touches upon multiple uh, SDG targets um, and the ability of trusted and inclusive IDs for accessing um, new and, and other services. But I think that uh, keeping in mind that privacy by design can also underpin other goals such as data governance and people-centric services. You know, one thing that um, sometimes we often forget in the semantics and the various terminologies is what do we mean? And um, essentially what we've been um, supporting in a number of countries is a, a continuum of support across, uh, across various stages. So uh, in, in some countries still working on building the foundational legal systems, whether it's um, identification, foundational identification systems or civil registration systems as those authoritative sources of basic identity. But then in countries where there is already high coverage of those, also thinking about digital identity for online remote transactions and opportunities for more innovative approaches such as federation and uh, decentralization, essentially thinking about the credentials for the digital age. And um, the next few slides, I'm going to touch on um, the, the benefits for both people and for countries. So um, for, for individuals, what we know is that um, uh, ensuring that the right to identity and um, really is, is key to um, well, independence as well as um, uh, uh, accessing their rights. And qualitative studies have shown in interviews the importance that people place on having an identification for their daily lives and that the difficulties they face when ID is inaccessible or untrusted. Um, and from accessing services to, um, uh, we know, for example, in Philippines that only 34% of adults had a bank account and 45% of the unbanked said that it was a lack of documentation, that was a barrier, um, and that one fifth of the poorest 40% have faced difficulty accessing government services because of a lack of identity, um, ID. That comes from um, various sources like index. Um, but and so, so the flip side of that is that having a form of ID uh, enables those services. And we also know from some recent impact evaluation how from a gender empowerment uh, perspective, it can also be quite powerful. So uh, um, a recent um, study that we've done uh, in Pakistan shows how female beneficiaries of the Benazir Income Support Program when using an authentication system that was built on top of a foundational ID system, um, increased control over their cash by 9.3 percentage percents. Because under the old uh, debit card uh, and PIN system, it was often um, other male members of the household who frequently collect on behalf of women. From a broader country perspective, we also have seen recently from a data set collected uh, around 80 some countries that countries with higher coverage of both um, good uh, identification systems, as well as digital uh, administrative databases. So other uh, administrative databases were able to more rapidly scale up their assistance during this, this past uh, couple of years and reach more beneficiaries with um, higher coverage. With that said, it is important to consider the critical risks and challenges. And we know from research done in many of our countries that um, the Barriers that are often faced when trying to uh, access IDs and many which disproportionately affect women, whether it's things like high transportation costs and long journeys, um, uh, as bribes that sometimes need to be paid, registration requirements um, for proof of citizenship or other specific documentation. And we know in some countries, additional requirements are, required, are needed for women, um, things like showing marriage certificates that women need to show that men do not have to, to show. So this is sort of a, a bit of a journey map of what we've seen across a number of different countries and some of the barriers. Uh, and we also know from our FINDEX uh, survey that uh, on average, 44% of women do not have an ID compared to 28% of men, so that, that gender gap. Um, all else equal women in low-income countries is 11 percentage points less likely to have an ID than a man. Um, and that these gaps are more concentrated amongst low educated and rural women. 
Um, and so I'm going to just not go through the, the other ones to save on time, but we get with this, this um, material that we can share after this. And so with all of that, getting ID right is therefore critical to the development agenda. Um, and one um, very powerful uh, approach of bringing together sort of a shared vision for what getting ID right means is um, the work that's been done with now 30 organizations on developing, co-creating these principles of identification for sustainable development, which, uh, as I mentioned, has now been endorsed by 30 organizations. Um, it really is these 10 broad principles, uh, which is really um, foundational uh, upon main issues of inclusion uh, and trust are the two main themes uh, around it, but also a good design, such as open standards and avoiding um, vendor and technology lock-in. But you know that to, to say that's uh, been a very uh, wonderful north star. But um, how do we actually help put those principles in, in, into practice? And we've been working with a number of countries, uh, almost fifty, to to think through what those good ID systems look like. Um, and from the core strategies of inclusion, inclusion by design is is critical. So um, looking at the barriers in access in access and laws and policies, procedures and technologies, and finding ways to remove them, uh, implementing more targeted strategies to address barriers that are faced by specific groups, um, thinking about appropriate use to so ensure that the use of ID is actually proportional to the risk and putting inclusion first, especially for essential rights and services, but then an ongoing engagement both with broader public um, individuals who are the ones who are uh, in the end the beneficiaries and uh, civil society engagements. And, um, there's uh, a number of different guides that uh, have been pulled together to talk about how to do this qualitative research well, as well as uh, ongoing work on engaging civil society organizations. And then in terms of, because of the, the focus of, of the discussion today on gender is a particular uh, set of issues around gender inclusive ID really requires more deliberate strategies. And um, as I mentioned, there are some countries which have um, particular discriminatory laws and practices that make it harder and more difficult for women. So identifying those um, uh, in, in one country, for example, uh, a woman had to be accompanied by a male member of the household. And so uh, removing that, or as I mentioned, some of these laws that require uh, additional um, certificates like marriage certificates. So removing those additional barriers, um, thinking about hiring female staff and women enrollment centers in some countries like in Pakistan that has made a, a significant difference. Training and incentivizing enrollment agents to work uh, and treat women with respect uh, and reduce discrimination, bringing these services closer to women so to reduce transportation and opportunity cost, using communication strategies that highlight the value for women. And some of the qualitative research that we've done is actually women, um, if they're not planning to be employed in the formal sector or are not the recipients of some of these services often don't know um, the benefits of, of having a um, forms of identification. And then, of course, looking at gender specific indicators um, to track progress. Um, and also just given the importance of this, of this topic of data protection and trust, um, thinking about not just adopting laws and regulations and policies that conform to best international practices and norms, which is um, a, a must, uh, having those laws as well as the institutions to ensure those are enforced, but also thinking about ways to build these systems with privacy by design and embedding some of those data protection and user control by default. And some examples of these privacy by designs are thinking about minimal data collection. You don't need to collect 70 fields of information on someone um, for them to be able to prove who they are. Thinking about data encryption, um, tokenization of the unique identifiers or randomized unique identifiers, um, uh, providing greater user control and Things like transparency portals, which I know in um, many of the countries uh, represented here, the ability for people to very transparently see how the information and data is being shared. And just to conclude, um, I think what we've been um, uh, advocating and working very hard with a number of different partners, um, including Liv, for example, on the, on the panel is um, thinking about how to really help shift the paradigm to build the 21st century ID systems. Um, with inclusion and trust at the heart of it. Um, and these are just some questions that are critical to think about, but can everyone get and use ID? Are the ID requirements proportional to the risk? Can service providers integrate? Do people have a voice and choice? 
Um, uh, can it be used reliably and accurately to verify a person's identity, our personal data, and privacy protected? And is there confidence and oversight to ensure that data will not be misused? And these are uh, quite critical and sort of the heart of the, the work that many countries are beginning to think about as they build the next generation forms of identification systems. Thank you very much and uh, look forward to an uh, active engaging discussion. Thank you, Vijayanti, for this presentation. And I'm sure that we can open further uh, the, the, during the discussion time what, uh, what needs to happen to actually ensure that this paradigm shift happens, like uh, that it's actually uh, realized. And uh, in My Data Global, our, our slogan is make it happen, make it right. So let's explore um, together uh, with, with other speakers that will now uh, give their comments to, 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 to this um, scene uh, set by you uh, and also further to, to identify those, those good practices and or call to action uh, for, for policymakers and, and implementators. Thank you, thank you so much. And with this, I would like to uh, welcome Leif Martek um, Northhaug from the Digital Public Goods Alliance. Um, Leif um, serves as the co-lead uh, of the Digital Public Goods Alliance, and that's the initiative that facilitates the discovery and implementation of digital public goods. And, and Leif, I know that also you're one of the, you as the organization, you're one of the signatories of the uh, those principles for identification for sustainable development. So I'm I'm looking forward to to hear from from you your uh, your intervention on the topic. Thank you so much, Carolina, and thank you also to Vajajanti for those um, very good introductory uh, words. Um, I'll just share my screen here very quickly. Uh, let me see. Are you able to see a presentation? Yes, yes, perfect. Thank you. Yeah, so I didn't, uh, I've just added a few slides because I do think that um, uh, Vajajanti has covered the big picture and, and I wanted to just provide um, one uh, subset of the discussion uh, to uh, on how to enable scale and, and this paradigm shift that uh, Vajajanti referred to, which I think is a very good word. Uh, I even have it on one, one of my slides myself. Um, so uh, just wanting to place uh, digital identity sort of into a broader framing and, and uh, they're commonly, uh, you know, the terminology used uh, is often digital public infrastructure. Sometimes we also hear references to, um, you know, gov stacks. Um, and these are some particularly foundational enabling technologies that all other uh, services, private and public, build on. Uh, so those are characteristics of what we refer to as digital public infrastructure. So they typically uh, cut across all sectors, they connect government, individuals and markets. Uh, and uh, examples, the most um, uh, known layers in this stack are the digital identity systems, payment platform, CRVS, um, civil registration vital statistics, and also other data exchange systems. Um, and of these layers, the digital identity system is probably the most foundational one that is the most crucial to get right because it enables and connects uh, citizens or uh, individuals to so much more. Let's see. I'm just going to see if I can manage to also run my slides here. Um, yeah, I think double click should help, but uh, I also had the same. I will manage. Let's see. Issue. Here we go. Oh, yeah, now it even went Perfect. Too yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yes. <laughs> Th thank you so much. So many screens here. Um, so uh, when we talk about, and, and um, my agenda touched about this for digital identity, when we talk about how to enable the scale of what we can call good digital public infrastructure, um, I do think one very important point to make is that you know we are all very concerned about increasing um, accountability uh, and trust and transparency and you know holding governments responsible for how they implement these systems and i think that's something there's fundamental agreement on that is needed but one challenge 
very often for this is that many governments actually do not have this kind of agency over how they implement and build out their uh, foundational digital public infrastructure. Um, there was this study done by ID for Africa in 2018, where um, those working on scaling identity systems uh, in, in, uh, in the, um, various African countries cited vendor lock-in as their strongest concern and the strongest challenge they faced. And what this means is that, you know, very often there are so um, high change fees or there are so many lock-ins to systems that are not really designed to meet that particular country need and where changes cannot be done. So it's actually, it can be quite hard for, for governments to make, uh, to, to even enable the systems they would want to deploy. So I do think that for enabling the kind of accountability and, and those inclusive and trusted systems that we want, we also need to make sure that governments have that kind of sovereignty to deploy them. Um, and uh, this is where this concept of digital public goods comes in and the paradigm shift that uh, Vajajanta referred to. Um, so digital public goods, they are they come out, uh, it's a concept that comes out of a high level panel that was established by the UN Secretary General in 2018 and where a report was published in uh, 2019 and where the UN Secretary General himself subsequently uh, came with his own take on that report in his uh, uh, roadmap for digital cooperation in 2020. So this definition speaks about digital public goods as open source software, open data, open AI models, open standards and open content that adhere to privacy and other applicable international and domestic laws, standards and best practices and do no harm. So in a way, this is, um, it's a subset of, of open source uh, and it's um, uh, where, where there are certain extra uh, quality assurance uh, um, criteria applied and also where there is a relevance to the sustainable development goals. And there are already um, many digital public goods now um, becoming available and increasingly well-funded. Some of them are also uh, managed uh, as part by countries as part of their own digital public infrastructure. Um, so some digital public goods that are particularly relevant for deployment as part of countries' digital public infrastructure uh, would include MOSIP, which is the modular open source identity platform, XROAD, which is this data exchange technology, which is um, managed by uh, Finland, Estonia, and Iceland as part of those countries' own digital public infrastructure, but which is then also made available for everyone else uh, openly as a digital public good. Um, there are also, uh, uh, there's also open CRVS for CRVS and, and the dig uh, digital payments platform, Mojo Loop. So those are just some examples. But I do think that these kind of large scale, well-funded and well-managed uh, well um, digital public goods uh, that are these um, generic state-of-the-art in a way, um, systems that countries can freely adopt and adapt to meet their contextual needs. Hold great promise for enabling um, a scale up of, of um, inclusive and trusted digital public infrastructure, including foundational digital identity systems. And in order for that to happen, um, much more is needed than just the actual open technology, but there is something about that transparency uh, by design, the opportunity to look under the hood at how a technology has been built that can be very important for driving this um, trust uh, and accountability uh, that, uh, that I mentioned on the previous slide and to enable an informed, much more informed uh, public discourse about um, to what extent a technology has been sufficiently well designed and adapted for that context. Um, and those would include also dimensions such as um, inclusivity and also the do no harm uh, principles that uh, Vajajanti talked about earlier. Um, and the combination of these kind of open technologies with substantial technical assistance that maybe has to look a bit different because it is technical assistance um, to deploy an open system rather to procure or lease uh, someone else's system which also means that 
governments need to uh, have a more active role, uh, be more accountable in a way, and uh, and uh, but also build up enough. Uh, in-house capacity to be able to make these strategic deci uh, decisions and implement these very, very foundational systems. But in the long run, I do think that that is also what is needed in order to drive this kind of national digital sovereignty and ultimately um, accountability for how these systems are deployed. Um, so I think I'll stop there uh, and uh, look forward to participating in the discussion afterwards. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you, uh, Lee, for, for bringing uh, all those uh, issues to our attention, also highlighting the, the need for transparency, accountability, and, and trust, and, and listing already some very practical uh, issues, what, what needs to happen to, uh, for, this, for this paradigm shift to materialize. Um, and with this, I would like to then uh, pass our uh, virtual uh, microphone to Rauno Merisari. Uh, Rauno is ambassador for human rights and democracy, um, joining us from, from Finland, representing Finnish Ministry for Foreign Affairs. And, and it's great that despite the fact that um, yep, the, the, uh, it's, a, it's a public holiday, it's the Independence Day in Finland, Rauno, you're joining us and, and uh, well, here also as the representative of the organization co-organizing this session. So, um, and the only representative of the, of the government in this session. So we are looking forward to hear uh, your thoughts and, and your uh, take on, on, on this issue of digital identity uh, and gender equality. Rauno, perhaps you can, uh, Unmute yourself and, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Carolina, and, and thanks again to my data uh, for arranging this, this session with, with our ministry. Uh, and thanks to also to Vaisada and Liv for the excellent um, introductions. Um, as Carolina said, the Finland celebrates the Independence Day it's a great honor to, to represent my government today in, at this panel. Um, and another reason to be proud of this position is because Finland is the chair of the Freedom Online Coalition in the government's organization for, for internet freedom. We hosted last week the FOC conference, the 10th anniversary ministerial meeting virtually and quite successfully, I believe. And also encourage you all to visit the FOC websites and look at the FOC joint statement on digital inclusion. <clears throat> As having so many experts of this particular issue at the panel, I will approach the data identity and gender equality based on my own expertise of human rights policy uh, and uh, with some general remarks about paradigms, if you like. Uh, my first um, re remark is, is about um, whether we should more worried or more hopeful if, if looking the digital identity. Um, I'm more positive. Um, the, as said here before, the documented personal identity, both online and offline, enables human rights, enjoyment of human rights, beginning from the right to life. Undocumented persons, also in my own country, are at the big, big risk of human rights violations and human trafficking. Um, not being able to prove own identity, more and more also in digital platforms can severely inhibit and even block access to essential public services, housing, social security, banking, healthcare, and telecommunications. A liberal tradition of human rights highlights negative obligations of the state to refrain from acting in a such way that violates human rights. Gathering of personal data will definitely increase the risk of misuse of data, and for instance, violate a right to private life, privacy. And we shall prevent such violations by data minimization, 
legal overseeing and good governance. These don't exclude the risk, but they can prevent and reduce it. Negative obligations are not enough in respecting and implementing human rights. States have also positive oblig obligations. According to provisions of the human rights conventions and treaties, the state bodies shall actively promote human rights, make them a reality for all, not just a principle. We shall respect and defend privacy, right to association and assembly, and many other civil and political rights while designing and using digital technologies. However, we can't look at only, only at, at civil and political rights, but also economic, social and cultural rights. Do the digital identification prevent or promote equal access to public or private services? Probably both. However, I believe that digital identification can be more as an uh, in a player, but only if the society is democratic and rule of law is respected. More authoritarian a regime is, more a risk of misuse and human rights violations exists. Human rights principles and standards are useful tool in assessing and implementing gender equality in digitalization and digital identity. Non-discrimination, transparency, accountability, accessibility, affordability shall guide the regulation and policies in designing and using digital identity. We shall prevent all forms of discrimination, including multiple and intersectional discrimination. I know that it takes time and resources to guarantee equal access to digital services, for instance, for disabled or AIDS women or persons belonging, sexual, belonging to sexual and gender minorities. Transparency and accountability can increase a trust in public digital services and digital identification. And, and the trust enables and speeds up uh, the use of such services and benefits of digital identification. Transparency and accountability is also in interest of those at risk of discrimination. But only if governments implement an overall policy for equality. My government, Finland, supports the European Commission's initiative to create a legislative framework for a European digital identity and a digital identity wallet application. It could be and it should be used for, both for public and private electronic and other services. Every European Union citizens and persons residing in the EU region would have access to personal digital wallet related to the state guaranteed identity. Digitally, uh, the legislation shall promote the digital inclusion of groups with low digital literacy and or who may experience significant barriers in the accessing services. Concept of privacy by design need to consider privacy at the, the initial design stage and throughout the complete, complete development process of new products, processes, services um, uh, shall uh, involve uh, the, all the personal data which is, in, which, is, which, which is used. And its legislation shall make implicit, ex explicit reference to data minimization. We promote concept of self-sovereign identity towards a digital identity that gives all individuals equally a control of their digital identities. My last point is, is to present a short case called the algorithm for gender equality. It is a campaign led by the Minister for Foreign Affairs of Finland aimed at promoting gender equality in and through technology.
The campaign is a part of the UN Women's Global Generation Equality Initiative, where Finland is one of the leaders in Action Coalition for New Technology and Innovations. The aims of the uh, Algorithm for Gender Equality um, the um, initiative is to narrow the gen gender gap in access to technology and digital competencies, to make technology respond equally to the needs of women and girls and all gender, and combat gender-based violence and discrimination online. We encourage uh, uh, to participate in the discussion with, within organizations and social media on how gender equality and non-discrimination are visible in your organization's activities and objectives. And, and sharing views and best practices on social media. And as a coalition leader for gender uh, equality, Finland welcomes businesses, civil society organizations, international organizations and foundations, and all technology sector operators to get involved in, the, in this campaign. Thank you, Carolina. Thank you, Rauno, very much for, for sharing your thoughts, uh, reminding us that uh, states should actively promote uh, human rights and, and also mentioning that we need time and resources to, to, to ensure this uh, uh, equal access and an equal um, uh, digital identity. And I'm, I'm sure we will also explore that, uh, how to best then uh, use this time and 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 the resources we have, and of course the call to action and the, the, uh, the about the initiative, we will also pass this uh, forward. Um, we have two more speakers to share their their thoughts and their um, interventions. Uh, one from uh, Marcel Anguno uh, representing uh, Afro leadership and the civil society, and, and the other from um, Hana Kamachi. Um, who is working for uh, Fujitsu, but I would like us to stop uh, shortly here to take a couple of minutes for some immediate questions that will be uh, brought to, to, to our uh, speakers by uh, my colleague Temu Roponen, uh, the, the general director of My Data Global. Uh, Temu, do you have some, some questions to Vijayanti, Rauno and, and Liv you would like to ask right now? Thanks, Carolina, and thank you, uh, uh, everybody, uh, to all the speakers and all the watchers. Uh, um, I do have a few questions. Uh, I've uh, had some myself, but uh, I will instead prefer to take those ones uh, by our active audience. Thank you very much. Uh, and let's uh, let's go a little bit in reverse. Uh, uh, so uh, to the ambassador, Merisari, uh, first, uh, um, there's a question that, can you tell me whether the digital wallet, and I think here referring to the EU uh, 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 digital identity wallet you were you mentioned uh, wh whether the digital wallet can protect the identity of the woman or children running away from a domestic violence household while supporting proper welfare. Uh, okay, a little bit spot on question. Uh, uh, um, I, I, I wonder if you might have uh, uh, insights, uh, perhaps even more broadly on the on the on the European digital wallet and 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 how that relates in particular to uh, uh, to gender equality. Thank you, Demo, and thank you. Very good and good news. Quite often, very difficult question. Um, so this is the the legislation is still in the pro process. Um, and I believe that everybody who are preparing uh, this legislation are acting in, 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 in good faith. Um, and we, we have also very strong non-discrimination legislation by the European Union. So, of course, our presumption is that the, also these kind of questions where um, to, to, to combat the gender-based violence online and offline must be also included this this legislation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And maybe we get to that uh, that more deeper uh, uh, later, possibly. Um, uh, then I have um, 
Uh, a question from Ms. Nurhaug. Uh, do you see the DPI being able to adapt in the global south and what kind of local adjustments uh, um, might be needed uh, there? Yeah, I, I think that's a great question. And I think the answer is even greater in the sense that I think the, um, these kind, particularly the, the open solutions, the digital public goods that are now being implemented as part of digital public infrastructure in many countries, they don't necessarily come from the traditional global north uh, at all. Uh, some of the most widely scaled um, technologies are increasingly coming from India, for instance, and, uh, and the most SIP um, has been developed uh, as a foundational digital identity system based on a lot of the experiences that have been had around Aadhaar in India. And, and uh, uh, Vayajanti has had the opportunity to, to watch that unfold very closely, much closer than me, because she came in earlier in that space. But I do think it's very fair to say that one of the things that uh, digital public goods uh, and the deployment of those as part of digital public, public infrastructure can enable is for technology to be shared uh, and, and to come and be created from uh, countries that are not the traditional development donors. Uh, Open G2P is another example of, a, of a, a payments technology that has been created in Sierra Leone. Um, and, uh, and uh, of course, Estonia's X-Road uh, or Estonia, Finland and Iceland's X-Road is also an example of a technology uh, that, uh, you know, was developed in a situation where there was a strong need uh, to put in place a secure data exchange in those contexts. Uh, but uh, Estonia is not a traditional development donor, even though it is becoming a development donor. So I do think it is a very interesting landscape. And I do think it, it, it can enable more real and genuine partnership. All right, thank you and keep those uh, uh, questions coming. Maybe just one more before we continue to, uh, 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 to Ms. Uh, Desai. Uh, um, you talked about the paradigm shift and what needs to happen. And that's, that's of course, uh, like always a huge, huge question. Who in fact are you looking at at, at most to, to, to act here? Uh, uh, and who is the one to, to follow from, uh, from your perspective? Is it is it India that the rest of the world needs to look into, or or, or what's uh, what's your view? So you no, know, the paradigm shift is really, and and this is a paradigm shift um, for the broader ecosystem. And so it's not just for thinking about how ID systems uh, move from the more the approach that countries may have taken in legacy systems or in the past decades of from a security, national security, or um, from purely from an administrative, but as a sort of an enabler for a service delivery um, uh, and empowerment. Uh, but it's also for the broader stack that, that Liv has, has mentioned. Um, and what we've seen from the government side is that it often takes a whole of government approach. There's no one um, ministry or agency that can that's really required, but thinking about what are these core foundational enablers um, that touches upon multiple sector use cases, whether it's um, government-to-person payments and delivery of social protection or delivery of healthcare. Or, uh, but also, so, you know, so I think from the government side is often a whole of government thinking differently about um, what's needed to be put in place from uh, the empowerment side um, and the development orientation uh, of these platforms. Uh, but it also requires a rethinking of the engagement between government and private sector, government and individuals, because um, oftentimes if there's just a core, these core digital public infrastructures, what were public platforms, are sort of the rails that, um, uh, that from a public sector perspective can be put in place. But you need private sector innovation to be built on top of it. And so um, things like a digital wallet, for example, is an example of uh, potentially a private sector innovation that can be built upon some of the core uh, digital enablers that the public sector provides. Um, and, um, and so I think it's sort of rethinking, but then also just engagement more broadly with individuals, like putting individuals uh, at, the, at the heart of this and designing these systems with individuals in mind as opposed to a broad uh, country uh, system in, in mind. So I think it it's a reshift in thinking of, uh, about these um, from a development and service oriented uh, uh, perspective. Um, just a, a couple, I just want to touch on um, a couple of the other questions as well. I mean, I think 
the the question on digital wallet, it, you know, it, it it's a wonderful new development to be where we're watching very carefully, and I think the uh, implementation of this in uh, in Europe can have wide ranging impacts uh, on the rest of the world. Um, obviously, the ability to have smartphone devices is a key requirement. So we are also thinking about uh, in other country contexts when smartphone devices aren't as ubiquitous um, of that ability to essentially have the in individuals have um, different forms of identification and other credentials in their own hands and to have that empowerment for them to be able to decide when to share and uh, use it. And so um, it actually can be seen from purely an empowerment perspective. Um, but, but one of the issues that we're watching carefully is for those countries that don't have high smartphone devices is how can we provide that same um, approach. And, and also to Lib's point, I think there's a lot of knowledge sharing that's happening south, 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 north, north, south. And so it's um, it's no longer the thinking of uh, a north, south that, that was gone several years ago, many years ago. All right, thank you. And we continue the discussion uh, um, after uh, after the rest of our, our speakers. So I'll just park it there for a moment uh, and hand it back to you, Carolina. Thank you. Thank you, Tamu, and thank you all for, for your uh, interesting uh, and uh, points that uh, definitely give us already some, some food for food for thoughts. And, and uh, as I said, we, we focus on identifying the good and bad practices for uh, implementation of policy making. And, and I think our, our list is, is growing. Uh, thank you for that. And then we, we move further. We have uh, still two colleagues representing different sectors. Uh, non-for-profit and, and business. And I would like to start from a uh, civil society representative, uh, our colleague Marcel Gunu, who is a policy director um, re um, responsible for gender in science, technologies, engineering, and mathematics at the organization called uh, Afro Leadership. And I think Marcel is joining us from uh, Cameroon and is also engaged in uh, my data uh, Cameroon Hub. Uh, Marcel, so with this, I would like to invite you to, to our stage and then pass the microphone to you. And I can confirm that we see your screen. Uh, maybe you can make it a bit bigger. I think it's uh, zoomed uh, to exactly. Uh, but we cannot hear you, so maybe. Is it okay now? Yeah, it's much better. It's still a bit small, but I think we can we can do it. Let me stop sharing here and just make it bigger. One moment, please. No worries, no worries. <laughs> so maybe I will use this uh, opportunity to, to let everyone know that, of course, we're happy to receive the uh, questions from the audience. We have small audience here with us at the session, so we can put your uh, questions in the chat. Uh, we hope uh, to, to get maybe some questions from our audience in, in Poland. Uh, so if, if you want to ask questions, then after our speakers, uh, um, speak, uh, to grab a microphone and then connect with us and then I will also monitor our social media and YouTube. But with this, uh, Marcel, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Karina. Okay, um, for, for my presentation, I would mainly focus on what we are doing uh, right now uh, in Cameroon. So we, we don't, we will not go to the whole Africa, but focus on our activities in Cameroon. Uh, Vivi and, and Liv has already set up the place with the report from the World Bank, so I, won't, I will not talk about it. However, even in Africa, the African Union has put a gender equality at, at the top line of the, of the activity uh, in Africa. And so far, things have been going really good because women are more and more visible in our society and every stage of the administration. And for now, we are around 24% of women, for example, at the parliamentary level. However, when it comes to the internet access, uh, even if uh, people are getting used to, to, to it, 
women are still behind when it's come to the to the full access to the internet so the the, the numbers are around 90 percent in sub-saharan country uh, another point i would like to highlight here is the access for finance to finance for the women is still very low uh, in our region so what we are doing is um let me go next so what we are doing regarding the, the identity in cameroon there's, there's a first part with the national ID, why we have a, a system as presented by, by Vivi and to have an ID card, you have to, to, to share some document like your birth certificate, uh, you have to prove where you live and uh, where you are working so that they can collect those information to make your, to build your ID. Now, when it comes to the digital identity, what we have, we are, we are sharing, we have been sharing with the, with the women is that your, your digital identity is not only what, what you make up. So as, as once as you are using the internet, you are starting from all uh, your fingerprint over the internet building that identity. So you must be careful. And in Cameroon, we do not, you don't have yet a kind of digital identity, but we have a digital certificate, which is delivered by, by Antique. And to have one, you have to have your ID card first. You have the birth certificate. There's a fees uh, um, with it, and the process can take like at least one month uh, to have it, uh, that certificate delivered to you. And this certificate can be requested by uh, by the civil as by the company. So there's there's no um, restriction, even if people does not really know that uh, they can request for it and, and have it for for their own activity. So in Cameroon. Uh, with women, we are working mainly uh, on empower, uh, empowerment. You know, we have started using the internet without, uh, uh, without let's say, being educated on how to use it. Though, so we are doing like a, a reverse engineering things now, trying to 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 cheat and to get educated on good practice on the internet. How do you make your research? How to build the right profile for your company? How how to to make the the good connection and the, and all the legal part around it. So when when the, the woman start a business uh, over the using the digital space, it's really difficult for for them to have that uh, digital certificate, just because they have to prove that they are entrepreneurs. And to prove that you are entrepreneurs in in our context, you need to have a kind of amount of trans business transaction and. They are, they are just starting, they, they cannot prove it yet. So it's really difficult for women now to have that certificate that they can, uh, they can link to the to their digital activity and even have their, their documents signed online with, um, and that are recognized everywhere. Working with women is one part of our work when it's come to, to uh, digital environment and identity. The next thing, and is that we are also working with parliamentarians in, in Cameroon. So the first, uh, the first step of our work is just to remove, we work with them to remove all the barriers to have a digital identity. And also with the discussion, we are, we are strengthening the opportunity for that, for gender equality. We have, we have seen that from when we are working with them, there's not a real uh, framework. And we believe that this framework should be defined uh, should be uh, put in place with clear definition on why, why, how, and why do we collect that those, those information? What will be the usage? And all, uh, and it should be aligned with the respect of the civil rights and the specificity of the locality too. We have started on that process. We have been uh, working on on uh, data uh, personal data protection right now, and we are also ready to start the conversation and regarding the, the digital uh, identity. Um, when, we, when we discuss on the field with the women, as well women, parliamentarians and business, there's a kind of, of fear uh, that is raised. Women are, are wondering, okay, now that we are starting to be seen on the, on the, global, uh, the global world, if, if we move to the digital uh, ID, all the all the, the not the uh, all the benefit we are having from the gender will we will we will can it uh, can we lose it 
So there, there's that reflection uh, that is going on and we are, we are giving them the, the answers uh, as, uh, as we are having them, we are collecting them so for, to, to let them know that, okay, there is no, if there's the risk of lose uh, the opportunity because you are, you, are, you are going to have a digital ID, it, it's not really, it's not real. The, the next point is how to build, I think, uh, live and, and, and live and the honey talk about it, is how to build the digital uh, ID system without a, a robust identification system, which is trusted by the and available for all. So, so that's it for, for my presentation and look forward for the question. Thank you. Bert, thank you, Marcel, so much for, for bringing us this um perspective from from Africa and from Cameroon. I really like those three remaining questions. Perhaps we will still be able to take them also with the with the other speakers. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, dear audience, I told you that we have uh, one more uh, speaker with us, but in fact, we have uh, two. So uh, we are still to, to hear from uh, Ms. Mohana Kamachi, uh, who is working for Fujitsu, and also our colleague Chris Erne, uh, Deputy Director from UN uh, Global Polls, has joined us. So um, welcome, welcome to, to, to both of them. And now I would so like to actually like to, uh, to give the floor to, to Mohana Kamachi, who uh, works as a chair of Gender Empowerment Network as uh, Fujitsu. Uh, so here also representing a big uh, international uh, organization, a company that actually uh, implements those solutions that uh, uh, some of those solutions are uh, uh, that, that we are discussing here uh, today. Uh, Mohana, we are looking forward to hear from, from you. Thank you, Carolina, for the opportunity. Uh, it's really a privilege to be here among these eminent panelists. And the happy Independence Day, Rauno. So I'm Mohana Kamachi from uh, Fujitsu, as Carolina said. Um, I'm based out of Chennai, India, uh, a land of social reforms and social reformers who fought against uh, social justice and inequalities. So as a result, India is one of the few countries where it is allowed to change your gender in uh, government IDs, uh, the gender that was given at your birth. Okay. And it is not mandatory for women to change their surname in IDs after marriage. But having said that, one cannot deny the digital divide in India and gender gap in digitalization that uh, YJT and uh, the, uh, the other panelists talked about. So India is one of the few countries where there's no data protection regime. So both the government and corporates freely collect and store huge quantities of user data with very little accountability. So this leaves the citizens vulnerable. Um, what I'm going to, today, uh, going to do today is uh, to talk about the digital divide based on the socioeconomic status and within that, the gender gap. Um, as you know, socioeconomic status can be broadly classified as uh, low, middle, and high. So, um, if you look at, uh, uh, and this, I'm going to talk from uh, an Indian perspective. Okay. So, if you look at women in low socioeconomic uh, status, they have low access to uh, internet and communication technologies and are also mostly illiterate. Um, what is the impact of the digital divide here? So we have in India smart ration cards. Ration cards are nothing but a government issued ID proof that helps people get food supplies at subsidized rates and get government uh, relief funds. So um, unlike countries, uh, developed countries like uh, Japan, where relief funds were issued to the head of the family, in India, uh, these relief funds can be availed by anyone in the family whose name is in the ration card. So the ration card contains names of all the family members. While this is a good practice, there have been cases where the relief funds were delayed as the biometric scanners used for identification had connectivity issues in rural areas. So this is an accessibility issue, although the policy is good. And similarly, uh, touching upon another accessibility issue, education became a question for children in rural areas during the pandemic, whereas in urban areas, the children smoothly shifted from regular classes to online classes. 
added to that, uh, like Vajanti was saying, the cost of uh, smartphones, availability of smartphones, data connections, made education inaccessible for children and this especially for girls because preference is uh, given, although it's totally changing now, for boys. And if you look at women in the middle uh, income groups, uh, they have access to internet, but not necessarily tech savvy. Uh, their digital IDs are often uh, with their husband, fathers or children. And if they sometimes have smartphones of their own or they do not uh, have it. And even if they do, they do not know how to use them completely or fully understand how data is collected. So they are the most vulnerable to digital frauds as they gullibly share information like OTPs without knowing who's asking for it or why it is being asked. And uh, going to women in high uh, socioeconomic status, they have access to uh, internet, are educated and are also tech savvy. But still you can divide them into uh, categories, one who are aware of data privacy issues and one who are not aware of that. So if you look at an example of the popular messaging app that rolled out a policy update few months ago, uh, the users were given an ultimatum to either accept the policy or stop using the app. However, the same app for users in Europe uh, did not have any such policy updates. So uh, if you look at the interesting statistics on what happened, the, out of the 52% who agreed to the changed policy, only 25% actually read the policy. This is what happens most of the time. We, don't, we just accept terms and conditions without seeing what actually is uh, we are accepting. And uh, this, despite India having a literacy rate of uh, 77 and above percent. Okay. And, ev and even the remaining 48% who did not agree uh, to the change policy, only 2.5% actually read the policy and then disagree. The others were just indifferent. So this is the condition of uh, awareness on data privacy and uh, data protection. Um, so data justice is a big question. So to conclude, I would recommend policymakers to be ethical and responsible when creating policies. Ensure data is used only for the purpose it was uh, intended and do not exploit the ignorance of users. Um, we should have a global standard for data justice, data privacy, like Rano said, is every human's right and not just the right of few countries. So deprival of data justice will lead to a new colonialism, if I may call it, which is the data colonialism. Thank you. And looking forward to the questions and more discussions on this. Thank you so much, uh, Mohana, for... for um bringing this perspective of also like different uh, socioeconomic uh, status that influences the, um, the access uh, to, to internet and also the uh, access to, to actually digital uh, rights. And, and also thank you for this very uh, clear uh, takeaways and, and calls to, to action. Um, and last but not least, I, I would like to invite Chris Erne, who is Deputy Director at the UN Global Pulse uh, New York. And then for those of you who uh, don't know uh, the, the UN Global Pulse yet, uh, very, very shortly does the UN Secretary General's Initiative on Big Data and AI for Development, Humanitarian Action and, and Peace and, and the initiative also to bring the um, real-time monitoring and production to, to the UN uh, work. And, and as Internet Governance Forum is a UN event, I'm, I'm very pleased uh, to, to, to welcome uh, Chris uh, to this discussion. Chris, I know that you had a bit of um, challenges to join Zoom. You were on your phone. Uh, are you able to, to take the floor? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks very much, Carolina. Um, I'm yeah, going to the floor is yours. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> hey, first of all, thanks very much for thanks very much for, for inviting me and, and for invite, inviting Global Pulse to, to this event. Um, I actually um, so Global Pulse works with um, works across uh, the length, breadth, and depth of the United Nations system. Um, and um, yes, we work on uh, big data, data science, um, futures and foresight. Um, behavioral science and, and, and so on and so forth. 
Um, one of the one of the big spaces that, that we've really tried to make an impact in is around um, is around internet governance um, and supporting some of our UN partners uh, in, in in kind of the policy space. So what I what I through through a number of different instruments, including via um, you know our participation in the in the broadband commission, um, but we also uh, we work with a range of partners outside of the United Nations system as well because. Um, you know, we recognize the diversity of, of perspectives and, and diversity of, of, of impact and, and, um, and we really try to take a systems approach when we, uh, when, we, when we support real challenges on the ground, which is where the, which is where the work of the United Nations is perhaps the most impactful. Um, so what I wanted to talk to you today about is actually um, taking quite a different perspective to, um, to digital identity and connectivity um, itself. Um, and really looking at connectivity as a as an enabling golden thread um, we work very closely with the with the united nations high commissioner for refugees and and what i want and this is an organization i used to work with as, as the head of innovation um, and so whenever i whenever we speak to um inclusion in um, digital identity spaces and connectivity i always like to uh, revert to my experience with the unhcr and, and working with displaced populations so these are refugees who people who've been forced to flee the the the, the um the uh, countries of origin and these are internally displaced people who have been uh, forced to uh, flee conflict within their uh, within their own country, um, it includes asylum seekers and, and so on and so forth. But really, the reason that I want to speak to uh, to these uh, populations is because when we speak about um, when we speak about connectivity and when we speak about um, inclusion, digital inclusion, um, inclusion in digital identity spaces, we always must remember to include the most vulnerable of our populations. And this is this is for, for a number of very, very obvious reasons, which I won't go into now. Um, but what I wanted to speak about is, um, is a range of research that, um, that, that the UN Refugee Agency had carried out um, that, that gave me um, many, many important insights into, into this line of work. And it gave me perhaps six or seven key lessons that I wanted to share with you today. Um, obviously, displaced communities and populations that host them have the right, they should have the choice um, to be a part of a connect connected uh, society. They should have access to technology that enables them to build better futures for themselves, their families, and, and also the world. Um, and what we've increasingly seen is disparities um, for uh, these most vulnerable populations. We know that um, around 1.7 billion women now own mobile phones in low and middle income countries or LMICs, and over a billion use mobile internet. But as the reach of mobile has grown, it's become an increasingly powerful tool uh, with which to deliver life enhancing information services and opportunities to millions who have not been able to have access to them before. Now for displaced people, um, UNHCR estimates that around 75% of refugees and displaced people are women and children. However, um, research that we carried out at UNHCR with, um, with the GSMA um, conducted in Tanzania um, and Rwanda, Jordan, and, uh, and a couple of other um, and a couple of other um, geographies showed really quite stark outcomes from research. 62% of men reported owning mobile phones compared to only 36% of women. This is a gender gap of about 42%. However, the mobile gender gap in refugee context has received very little dedicated attention, partly due to the dearth of gen gender disaggregate disaggregated data available, partly because um, displaced populations simply don't fit the um, simply don't fit the ease of um, market penetration that, that mobile network operators perhaps might enjoy with, with other populations. Um, and what we found is that when we look at digital identity and all of the um, services that, that this could enable us to, to unlock, uh, this includes protection services, this, is, this includes access to education, livelihoods opportunities, social capital, access to mental health services, access to finance, and simple access to communication around what services are or are not available to displaced populations. We, we find that um, we find that there, there becomes a gender divide between those who have access to these empowering uh, communications efforts and, and information put out by aid agencies such as UNHCR and its partners and, and broader uh, UN development efforts. 
Um, but it also um, it, it can also be extremely uh, disempowering for, for female uh, populations within within um, displaced set, displacement settings because they simply don't have access to devices, let alone perhaps the finances to um, to uh, to become connected, even if devices are available. Um, and this is something that um, this is something that I think is in, incredibly pertinent to this conversation because um, because when we move into displacement settings, both for those who have been forced to flee, but also those who are hosting um, refugee populations, um, we find that um, the disparities become even more pronounced, even more acute in populations that are already vulnerable. So I wanted to share with you a few lessons learned from, uh, from our work uh, when I was at UNHCR and, and indeed uh, whilst at UN Global Pulse, where we work with a range of partners, including uh, the GSMA, um, including the, the, broad, broad pan, brand, the Broadband Commission. Um, and when we think about um, when we think about gendered um, gendered access, when we think about gendered access to connectivity, but also the services that that, that golden thread can can empower people's uh, lives um, moving forwards. So one. Um, the internet interconnections between digital identity, data, data protection, data justice, and gender equality have to be much more than just about service provision. We have to view, um, we have to take a 360 degree view um, around connectivity itself, and whether that is the provision of digital identities or access to services um, themselves. We must make sure that. Um, we must make sure that we're um, promoting a better version of um, a better version of life uh, via uh, connectivity, rather than um, rather than reinforcing some of the gender norms and and, um, and negative aspects to, to access that, that we're seeing currently, particularly within the most vulnerable of our populations. Uh, secondly, when we look at uh, good and bad practices in, in policy making and practical um, implementation, we must make sure that we have a very we we have a robust understanding of all of the actors um, involved in this space. This includes private sector organizations as well as broader civil society and humanitarian and development circles. I think too, too often we see um, quite a stark divide between in, in understandings perhaps of the ubiquitous private sector for-profit uh, organizations who, who humanitarians in particular don't necessarily have such a robust understanding of. But then on the other side, when we look at private sector, large private sector organizations, whether mobile network operators or, or even the regulatory spaces, um, there can be quite a quite a, um, a, a warped understanding of what humanitarian actors are there to, to, to do and, and to promote. So we need to have um, a 360 uh, degree understanding of the challenges we're, that we're trying to solve and we need to create inclusive spaces for, for perhaps non-traditional actors uh, to, to be involved and, and to have dialogues and, and better understandings of how we can lift up those most vulnerable populations. Thirdly, um, when we look at sets of principles that support um, technological progress and digital services, um, I think that we need to revert to a shared values partnerships and a much more uh, sophisticated understanding of who we're working with on the ground, um, what are the systems we need to change, and what is the evidence base and research-driven decision-making that, that we need to all get behind to improve the lives of the most vulnerable. Four, um, where we look at uh, progress in the area of digital services, um, I think that policy spaces um, need to be much more robustly engaged in, whether we're looking at SIM registrations li linked to valid ID, um, know, your, know your client, KMI, IMEA. Um, what we see is uh, policy spaces require a lot more work, um, opaque access requirements, including dormancy um, periods, engagement with regulators, government service providers, as well as human development organizations uh, require an awful lot more um, understanding um, and it really is the policy uh, spaces and the prosaic spaces around which we um, can guide decision making that, that requires an awful lot more um, an awful lot more work five and I'm almost done um, gender bias in technology development and policy making um, whether we're looking at digital uh, humanitarian digital teams um, on a global level or at a local level also requires a lot of work and um, when we when we look in the humanitarian and development space we also see a lot of um, gender disparities in terms of our own workforces 
Um, and that's something that um, that's something that people don't necessarily like to talk about, but it's harmful when we look at digital design and and, uh, and the design of policies themselves in terms of access. Um, and the last point I would make um, is that um, is that when we do look at this space and we do look at the the evolving uh, gendered um, norms uh, around access to, to digital ID or beyond, uh, we need to look, take a much further look into the future. And um, we need to engage with foresight efforts, um, and we need to make sure that these are in inclusive and, and empowering. For thank you very much, Carolina. Over to you. I can see you nodding because you want me to be quiet. <laughs> Oh, thank you so much, Chris, for, for all those points and, and again, bringing the, the, the perspective of the displaced populations and, and women from, from, from displaced population to, to this discussion. And again, sharing great uh, call to, to action and then key takeaways. And this actually brings me to, to the, well, this brings us to the discussion part. We have some 13 minutes to the end of the session. So I would like to uh, pass the microphone again to to Temo, um, do you have some questions for our panelists? Thanks, Carolina, uh, and thanks to the speakers again. Uh, I do, I have a lot, uh, but we have a little, uh, just a little bit of time. Um, so, um, so and, and keep those questions coming. I prefer to take them from, from the audience rather than, uh, than myself. Um, but, but in this round, I will start perhaps first with Marcel and Gounou. Uh, uh, Marcel, it was wonderful to hear hear what's on the ground in in, in Cameroon. Uh, uh, what's uh, uh, I mean, many of many of the the speakers, of course, had a very kind of high level and sometimes even slightly difficult to understand uh, um, um, points uh, uh, in in some way in terms of concreteness. Uh, uh, what's what's the concrete thing that's happening in Cameroon, and what would be your concrete ask? To, uh, uh, to the others, what do we need to drive uh, drive this forward? Uh, the gender balance in digital identity. Marcel, Marcel I think uh, you are uh, uh, muted, I'm sorry. We're still not hearing you. Hello? No, here I'm we go. Yeah. So I was saying that in Cameroon, what, what is happening now is that um, as as the, the, the government has signed the, 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 the Convention of Malabo regarding the cybersecurity, they are putting everything in place to have really um, a digital space, the safer possible right now with all the, the input they have. So you have at the, at the legal level, you have those parliamentarians working uh, at the legal level to, to build the laws that will uh, that will be put in place to have that uh, the, the legal framework. The next step, which is which has been doing, is that um, in the organization round, there is a training of um, which is organized, and in the training, there is like you have to have some women. It's an obligation to have at least. 30% of women that is that are attending the training with so that we, we make sure that uh, women are also in the process of uh, of the decision and the, and the contribution to to promote uh, the, the digital space in, in our in in the in the, in the country so uh, and lastly is the work doing done by the civil society with the training as i, I said because really there is there is a need for training People should learn how to use it because the first thing we were using the, the, the digital space was it was just for fun. Okay, I'm 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 visiting an area, I'm publishing some photo. So now this, how to use it for for your development, how to be safe over the internet because we have been facing some dramatic incident. So there's a there's a there's an education on the ground with not only Afro leadership but many others organizations and we are working together on that side too. So there's really three level of uh, of intervention to to build that space in our country. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, uh, Marcel, for that. And I will use that as a bridge to uh, 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 to, uh, to Mohana Kamachi. Uh, uh, you mentioned also taking well into consideration, as Karo mentioned, that that. Indeed, we have the different income cl uh, uh, classes and, and who, who may have different issues 
uh, but I think you pointed out uh, um, as well the issues of uh, of educating the, the 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 individuals of the people. Uh, um, but what are what needs to happen there concretely? And then secondly, I will just uh, add there another question that uh, what, that what, that I received. That what are some of the best practices followed in India to ensure gender equality? Are there perhaps something you are doing great, uh, uh, or is being done great in India regarding uh, uh, teaching of uh, of the population, or is that the big gap? We are not hearing you. Um, so, so Mohana Kamachi, are you there with us? Sorry, yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. We cannot see you yet, but we can hear you. All right, wonderful. Hopefully you can see me as well now. Yes. So I'll, I'll take the last question first. So some of the best uh, practices followed in India is for uh, gender equality is um, Uh, you know, in India, there's a preference for uh, male child in some regions. So uh, because of that, earlier there were uh, prenatal abortions uh, if the child was a girl. But uh, since 1994, the government made it illegal to reveal the gender of a child. So even uh, the healthcare workers who do the ultrasound, they cannot um, reveal the or know the gender of the child. So this... Uh, I think uh, has uh, improved the uh, uh, sex ratio and uh, India had uh, gender ratio imbalance until recently and now uh, it's no longer there. All right, that was quite, uh, quite interesting. Uh, and then to our, our third speaker of the, of, of the second, second batch uh, uh, to Chris. Uh, um, so uh, what what should we start? What should we stop? What should we continue doing in, in, in the attainment of our aspirations to uh, uh, regarding a digital identity for gender equality and justice? What to yeah. start? What to stop? What to continue? Uh, um, I know it's a big question, but if we can summarize on that. Uh, I mean, I get, my brain is going off in all sorts of different directions now, Timu, so thanks for that. Um, look, what, I think one, the first thing that we need to do and what we, what we need to start to do is being in more and more um, evidence-based um, and re research-based. Um, and this is, is such an obvious thing to say, um, but I think that, um, I think that in, particularly in the humanitarian and development space, we find it really difficult to step outside of our own systems and to see the broader world at work. And that includes uh, the complexity and, and complicatedness of, of private sector organizations. And I don't, wanna, I don't really wanna reduce this down to, you know, you must work with the private sector, but we must work with the private sector. And that involves um, not only only us being able to look outside of, 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 of who we normally operate with, but also being able to bring in uh, new skills, talents and expertise who can better understand the world outside our systems. So I think that's one thing we need to start doing. I know lots of efforts have been made in that respect. I think the second thing that um, what we must stop doing um, is, um, is thinking that just by saying you know, here's a here's a challenge and here's a clear need that the world is simply just gonna is is gonna react and 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 start to to help the most vulnerable of our populations. We need much more uh, sophisticated understandings of how we can change behaviors and alter and adjust investment um, in um, incentive structures for 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 profit entities um, as well as for regulatory spaces and, and legal spaces. Um, and then the, then the third thing um, in terms of what we need to keep on doing, um, we need to keep on um, we need to keep on highlighting the, the needs of the most vulnerable of our populations. We're, we're, we're entering an increasingly turbulent world um, with more disparities, with more um, disparities between the, the haves and the have nots, um, and it is becoming more and more binary. Um, Organisations such as the United Nations and all of its partners are here to, to help identify those needs, but also to, to share those needs and, and to advocate for filling those needs with, with a diversity of actors. And, and we need to keep doing that, but, but do it a hell of a lot more uh, better and, and with more um, impact. Um, over to you, Timo. 
Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Chris, for that. Uh, uh, and we, we realize we're a bit short on time, many questions to remain unanswered. I will ask the first uh, three uh, speakers to, to perhaps take a key takeaway. It would be wonderful if you can take away something you learned or something you appreciate from the perspectives of, uh, uh, of the other speakers. Uh, so perhaps I will ask uh, uh, Vijanti Desai uh, if you can first uh, uh, in less than a minute uh, to kind of kind of like highlight what was your key takeaway from uh, from this session what would you like us to take home um so uh, that's quite a difficult uh, question but I, one, one thing is that I think there was just a resounding sort of alignment across uh, a number of the speakers on putting inclusion uh, and trust at the heart of uh, all of these platforms that we're uh, talking about and i think it came out in uh, both in the broader sense but also in the very specific um uh, examples that were highlighted. Thank you, uh, uh, thank you indeed. And uh, and over to you, Liv uh, Um What's uh, what's what's your 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 summary? No, uh, thank you so much. I think I would just uh, like to pick up uh, and and echo. I mean, I I'm very well aligned with everything that has been said. But there was one particular point on the role of the private sector. So I think I completely agree that even you know when we talk about open systems. And, and, uh, and open source. That does not mean that there is not a significant role for the private sector. I would almost say it's the other way around because it can allow um, large systems integrations, contracts, et cetera, potentially uh, also over time, much more uh, involvement of the local vendor ecosystem. So I think I would want to you know, echo uh, working with the private sector, but again, stress that for this paradigm shift, to really happen, we should really look at how to involve the local vendor ecosystem and local vendors in this, so that you know the um, the value added really more of that remains also in the countries where these systems are being deployed. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and to close, uh, uh, Ambassador Rauno Merisari, uh, um, can you summarize what uh, your takeaway? Thank you, Temu. Uh, I believe that we are, we are pretty much in common. We all talk about the um, the transparency and, of course, inclusion. Um, and uh, again, the question of empowerment, digital literacy, etc. That's something we we still need to need to con consider more. Thank you, Temu. Thank you very much. Uh, and, and with that, I will actually pass my uh, virtual mic uh, over to uh, Carolina, our host. Carolina, there you go. Thank you very much, Temu, and thank you all. Uh, so, uh, thanks to, to all speakers. It was a pleasure to uh, listen to you uh, and, and, and also hear those uh, from from different perspectives uh, learn from each other and that it was said well we are pretty well aligned um, and the message but there is still a lot uh, a lot of things to be done and maybe if i can share with you my well key takeaway that i think some sums up this very well it was what chris said that we need to promote a better version of life through the connectivity and not only like continue doing what we are doing uh, wrong in the in the real life so thank you all uh, thanks to, to Vijanti, Rauno, Marcel, Chris, Mohana, Liv, coming from different countries, different regions, uh, connecting at very different times uh, on, on this um, 6th of December, uh, Monday, uh, for, for this discussion about the digital identity for gender equality and, and data justice. The session was brought to you by uh, My Data. Uh, global and the Finnish Ministry for Foreign Affairs. And if you would like to learn more about my data, uh, who we are, uh, what do we do, and, and why we're called global, um, then uh, Follow us on social media and, and also, of course, website mydata.org. And we continue this and, and other discussions around the uh, human-centric approach to, to personal data and human-centric uh, internet, uh, well, within the My Data community, and also at the upcoming uh, My Data conference, which we hope to host uh, on site, in person, live uh, in Helsinki uh, in June. 
So thank you so much for, for this one and a half hour. I wish you all a lovely uh, Monday uh, and, and again, happy Independence Day to, to Finland. <laughs> thank you so much.